I should turn with me to James chapter 4. James 4. Last week I began the sermon by asking this question, are you a defeated Christian? Now I'm not sure how you answered that question, but I do know that there are a lot of defeated Christians sitting in churches today and every other Sunday. Last week James helped us identify the problem as to why Christians are not walking in spiritual victory. And if you missed that sermon, I would encourage you uh, just to go sometime at your convenience, check it out on our church website. Uh, but today, we're going to be looking at James chapter 4, uh, verses 4 through 10, in a message that I've titled, How to Walk in Spiritual Victory. So in verses 1 through 3, we find James identifying the problem as to why we're not uh, walking in spiritual victory. The verses that we're going to be looking at today, uh, he gives us the solution as to how we can walk in spiritual victory. Uh, in these verses, we find the solution, how we can live a victorious Christian life. And before we read these verses, before we discover the solution on how we can live a victorious Christian life, let me begin with a quote by the late evangelist and revivalist Vance Havner, uh, who once said this, most church members live so far below the standard, you'd have to backslide to be in fellowship. We are so subnormal that if we were to become normal, people would think that we were abnormal. You know, today there's so much talk about the need for revival. But what we need to understand is what we call revival is really to be the norm. What we call revival is to be the lifestyle of every believer of Jesus Christ. It is walking in spiritual victory. You know, there have been times where I have witnessed people who you could say that they, they had an encounter with the Lord Jesus and they're on fire for him and they're passionate about him. They come into a church and they're excited about him. And you know what people say about them? They're strange. They're different. No, that's normal. We're to be passionate about Jesus. We're to be excited about our relationship with him. We're to be walking in spiritual victory. And so as we look at these verses today, I want you to do so with the understanding that the steps that James teaches us to take should be steps that we're taking every single day so that we can walk in spiritual victory and not in spiritual defeat. So if you would, stay with me as we honor the reading of God's Word today. James chapter 4, beginning of verse 4, says, You adulterous people... Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealousy, jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Father, thank you again for the opportunity to hear your word. May we receive it joyfully, may we be changed by it, and may we be people who walk in spiritual victory, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. James begins his letter, or at least this part of his letter, by calling his readers adulterers. James writes in verse 4, you adulterous people. 
Now, if James, if James's readers had dozed off at any point uh, during the reading of this letter, my guess is that this probably shook them out of their slumber. I'm sure there were some who heard James's description and they thought, you know what? I've not been unfaithful to my spouse. James is not talking about me. But the adultery that James was referring to was not, a, uh, was not a husband being unfaithful to his wife or a wife being unfaithful to her husband. The adultery that James was talking about was a believer being unfaithful to Jesus Christ. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul says that a marriage between a man and a woman is a picture of Jesus Christ's relationship with the church. In Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 31, Paul writes, Therefore a man and woman shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. And listen to what he says. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. As a man leaves his father and mother and holds fast to his wife and they become one flesh, Paul says we are to leave all, we are to hold fast to Christ and we are to become one with him. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 17, Paul writes, But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. And then in 2 Corinthians 11, 2, Paul writes, For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betroth you to one husband, so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. Scripture is clear that as believers we have a spiritual union with Jesus Christ. We have entered into a covenant relationship with Jesus Christ, whereas we are to love him with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength. Our attention, our affection, our allegiance is to be to Jesus Christ alone. James says to his readers, you have not been faithful to Christ. Your devotion has not been to him. You have committed spiritual adultery with this world. I want you to look what James writes in verse 4. He says, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. The word that James uses here for world is cosmos. It refers to the world system that is, that is at odds with God. The world in which we live, our culture, our society, it is anti-God. It is anti-Christ. The world has a, it has a hedonistic way of thinking. Hedonism is, a, is the pursuit of pleasure. And that is our world. That is the world in which we live. Our world is all about pursuing pleasure. It's all about a sensual self-indulgence. If it feels good, what? Do it. The world in which we live is a hedonistic world. And the world in which James readers live was one that had a hedonistic way of thinking. Hedonism always has been, it always will be the way of the world. The way the world thinks, the way the world acts, it is at war with the ways of God. It is at war with the mind and the conduct of Jesus Christ. Therefore, when a believer becomes fond of the ways of the, of the world, when, when a believer begins to think, you know what, it's all about my pleasure. It's all about seeking my own pleasure. When we, when we become that person and when we become so fond of the ways of the world, it puts us fighting against the ways of God. Friendship with the world, James says, makes you an enemy of God. Now I want you to understand something today. I don't, I don't want you walking out of here today misunderstanding. Please don't hear what I'm not saying. Understand that James is not saying believers can't be friends with lost people. It's not what he's saying. Jesus was a friend of sinners. That's what he was called. He was a friend of sinners. But Jesus didn't think and he didn't act like them. Jesus was a friend of sinners, but Jesus wasn't a friend of the world. And there is a difference. 
When a believer becomes a friend of the world, they have become a spiritual adulterer, according to the book of James. James continues in verse 5, he says, Well, do you suppose that it, is, that it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? James is saying that the entirety of scripture teaches us that the Holy Spirit who lives within the believer jealously desires that the Holy Spirit, uh, that, that that person completely possess that believer and control their life. That's, that's what the Holy Spirit desires within you. The Holy Spirit desires that you be completely possessed by him and that the Holy Spirit control your life. The Holy Spirit has one envy. Just one. One envy. One desire. One longing. And that is our entire devotion to Jesus Christ. <coughs> James says he yearns jealously for us. See, God's jealousy for a believer's faithfulness is like a husband or wife longing for their, their spouse's fidelity. I mean, as a husband or wife, don't you, want your, don't you want your spouse to be faithful to you? Don't you want them to be devoted to you? Well, in the same way, Jesus Christ desires that we would be faithful to him. We are the bride of Christ, and the Holy Spirit does not want us to go somewhere else the pleasures of this world to have our needs met. He wants us to come to Him to have our needs met and not to go to the world to find pleasure in the things of this world. And listen, if, if, that, is our, if that is our way of thinking, if, that is, if, if that's the way that we're living our life, then we are, we are guilty of, of, of committing spiritual adultery. We're not walking in spiritual victory. We're walking in spiritual defeat. So how do we walk in spiritual victory? That's the question I want us to answer today. How do we do that? First, we have to devote ourselves to Christ. We have to devote ourselves to Christ. 2 Corinthians 11.3, Paul writes, But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. If we're going to walk in spiritual victory... We must devote ourselves to Jesus Christ. That is, we must give ourselves completely to Him. Our heart must belong to Him. Peter writes in 1 Peter 3.15, But in your heart, set, up, set Christ apart as holy, acknowledging Him, giving Him first place in your lives as Lord. Now, if I were to ask you when you gave your heart to Jesus Christ, what would you say? Think about that. If I were just to come up to you and say, when did you give your heart to Jesus Christ? How would you respond to that? Most of us would probably answer that question based on the day that we gave our heart to Jesus Christ for our salvation. Well, I gave my heart to Jesus Christ 50, 55 years ago, or I, I gave my heart to Jesus Christ 30 years ago, or I gave my heart to Jesus Christ 15 years ago, or I gave my heart to Jesus Christ 5 years ago. Or five months ago. When did you give your heart to Jesus Christ? You know how every believer in this room should answer that question? I gave my heart to Jesus Christ today. I gave my heart to Jesus Christ today. You know, I didn't just give my heart to Melissa 12 years ago. Do you realize that every single day I get up, I give my heart to her? Well, in the same way, it's not like, well, there was one day I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. Yes, you gave your heart to Jesus Christ for salvation. But listen, it isn't just about giving your heart to Jesus Christ one time in salvation. Listen, it's about giving your heart to Jesus Christ every single day in dedication and devotion to him. When did you give your heart to Jesus Christ? If we're going to walk in spiritual victory, if that's going to be the reality of our life, then every day that we wake up on this earth, we must set apart Jesus Christ as our one true love. We must devote ourselves to finding our pleasure in Him and not in the ways of this world. You say, well, how do we devote ourselves? 
to Jesus Christ? How do we keep from being led astray in our heart and mind to the ways of this world? How do we do that, Pastor? There's only one way, and that's by the grace of God. It's only by the grace of God. James writes in verse 6, he says, but he gives more grace. Man, that is a beautiful, beautiful part of Scripture. If you've never underlined that, man, highlight that, mark it up. He gives more grace. Grace has been defined in many ways. And, and, and listen, I'm not saying that this definition is the, the only definition, but it's one that I have fallen in love with through the years. Grace is the empowering presence of God that enables us to be who God has created us to be and do what God has called us to do. Listen, we need grace for salvation. But listen, we need grace every single our, every day of our lives to be the people that God has called us to be and to do what he's called us to do. And so grace, it's God's favor, it's God's help, and we need God's grace for salvation, yes. But we also need God's grace to live a life of dedication to Jesus Christ. We can't do it in our own power. We can't do it in our own strength. We'll never live a life of dedication and devotion to Jesus Christ in our own power and strength. We'll be led astray to the ways of the world. James says the Spirit of God gives more grace. Some translations say greater grace. Greater than what? Greater than our wills. Greater than our own selfishness. Greater than our, our inability to relinquish control. Listen, that's the primary work of the Holy Spirit to give us the grace we need to live for Jesus Christ. Listen, it's not easy to turn from the self-centered pride of life and humble ourselves in devotion to Jesus Christ. It's not easy. The only way that we can do it is by the grace of God. But when we do, when we humble ourselves before God, when we turn to Him in humility, listen, we find a storehouse of God's grace ready to be poured out on us. James continues in verse 6. He says, therefore, it says God opposes the proud. But what's He do? He gives grace to them. So how do we walk in spiritual victory? Well, we have to be, we have to devote ourselves to Jesus Christ. The way we live that kind of life of devotion and dedication. Every single day where we say, my heart belongs to you. It's by the grace of God. Second, we must not only devote ourselves to Christ, we must also submit ourselves to Christ. James writes in verse 7, verse 7 he says, submit yourselves therefore to God. The word that James uses here translated as submit, it's a military term. And it means to, to place under orders, to place in rank. Now I know in this room today, there are those of you who have served in the military. And thank you for your service. There's, there's those of you sitting in this room, one day you will serve. And we thank you in advance. But everyone in the military understands their rank. Everyone in the military understands their rank and they submit accordingly. A general doesn't take orders from a private. A private takes orders from a general. A private understands his or her rank and places themselves under orders or submission to those higher than them in authority. Well, as believers, we must understand that Jesus Christ outranks us. He outranks every single one of us. In fact, Paul says in Philippians 2, 9, that Jesus Christ has been highly exalted and given the name above all names. Jesus himself said in Matthew 28, 18, this is the Great Commission. You remember what he said? He said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to who? He said, it's been given to me. Jesus Christ outranks all of us. Therefore, we should submit ourselves to his lordship. We should submit ourselves to his authority over us. 
Every day we should humble ourselves before Jesus Christ as our Lord. And you know what we should say to him every single day? We should say to him, the answer is yes. Now what is the command? It's not, I'm going to wait and hear what the command is, and then I'll decide whether or not I say yes or no. It's, the answer is already yes. What's the command? Because no private, no private says, well, let me wait. See, General, you tell me the command, then I'll decide whether or not I want to follow it. No, you know what they're saying? The answer is yes. What's the command? That's how we should live our lives before the Lord Jesus Christ. When I get up tomorrow... The next day, the next day, it should be, Lord Jesus, the answer is yes. What's the order? What's the command? What is it you would have me to do with the life that belongs to you? We will never walk in spiritual victory if we don't submit ourselves to Christ. When we refuse to submit to Christ, we are opposing him. We are opposing his authority. In essence, we are saying to Christ, you know what we're saying? I outrank you. And that is pride. I mean, isn't that pride for anyone to say to the Lord Jesus, I outrank you? James says God opposes the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. And then he continues, resist the devil... And he will flee from you. Do you remember? Do you remember what Satan, or as he was known before, you might know Lucifer. Do you want, do you remember what his what the sin was that got him booted out of heaven? It was pride. It's pride. He didn't understand that God outranked him. He wasn't willing to submit. In Isaiah 14, beginning in verse 13, we're told what was in Lucifer's heart. Isaiah writes, you said in your heart, this is what Lucifer said, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. I will, I will, I will. Listen, Lucifer didn't submit to God's lordship and authority. He was full of pride instead of humility. And James says to us, resist the devil. Resist the devil. That is, resist the devil's way of thinking, which is the world's way of thinking that refuses to submit to Jesus. The Bible says that one day everyone's going to submit. Everyone's going to submit. Philippians 2, 9, 9 through 11 says, Therefore God was highly exalted, has it highly exalted him, speaking of Jesus, and bestowed on him the name that is above every other name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There is a day coming where everyone's going to recognize that Jesus outranks and they're going to bow their knee in submission. But I want to tell you, better to bow your knee now and be practiced up than to have never, ever bowed your knee until that day. Because that day's coming. We have to understand who Jesus is. He has been exalted. He has been given the name above every other name. He is King of kings. He is Lord of lords. He is the one that we are to submit to and not be like the devil. We need to resist the devil. Resist the devils. Listen, the devil wants us to walk in pride. The devil wants us to be full of pride and not submit ourselves to the, to the Lord Jesus. And, and listen, as we do that, we will walk in spiritual defeat, not spiritual victory. We need to practice daily submission to Christ if we're going to daily walk in spiritual victory. And then James writes this in verse 10. Humble yourselves before the Lord. And what's the Bible say? He'll exalt you. As believers, we need to remember the way up to victory is down. 
and the way down to defeat is up. What does that mean? It simply means the way to be exalted by Christ is through humility. And the way to be humbled by Christ is through pride. 1 Peter 5, 6 says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time He may exalt you. So how do we walk in spiritual victory? First, we devote ourselves to Christ. Second, we submit ourselves to Christ. And third, we draw near to Christ. James writes in verse 8, Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Now, in terms of salvation, we can't draw any nearer to God than we already are. When we place our faith in Christ alone to save us, 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says we are immediately baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. Ephesians 4, 30 says we are sealed by the Spirit for redemption. And so these, these verses speak of our position in Christ, which can never change. Our relationship with God is settled. We are his children. And so James is not speaking about drawing close to Christ for relationship, but rather for fellowship. See, the believers that James was writing to, they had drifted away from God. And so their fellowship with God, that's what was needed to be restored. That's what needed was needed to be restored. Uh, I heard a story about a wife who used to sit right next to her husband in his pickup truck. Some of you used to do that. The day that you sell a pickup is the day you know something's not going on right, right? I'm going to get something where they can't sit. No, I'm just kidding. Something happened. Over the course of time, something happened. She gradually moved farther away from him. I mean, she used to just jump right into the cab and get right next to him, snuggle up to him, you know. But over time, she just gradually began to move farther and farther away. But one day as they were riding along in a, in a pickup truck, the wife said to her husband, husband, she said, I miss the days when we used to ride next to each other. And the husband responded, I haven't moved an inch. <laughs> Christ never moves an inch away from us. If we're not as close to Christ as we used to be in fellowship and intimacy, we are the ones who have moved away and allowed sin to pull us away. And so the assurance that James gives us is that Christ is always ready to have us sitting close to him again. James writes this in verse 8. He says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. If we take one step toward God, just one step, the parable of the prodigal son teaches that he'll close the distance by running to us. You remember that story? The parable of the prodigal what had been lost there? It wasn't the relationship that had been lost. He was still a son. What was lost? Fellowship. And what happened? He decided that that son, one day woke up, came to his senses, and he decided that he was going to take one step toward his father to restore that fellowship. And you remember what happened? The father ran to close the distance. And that's exactly what happens. If we'll draw near to God, he'll draw near to us. So how do we do that? How do we, how do we draw close to Christ in fellowship. Well, first of all, we cleanse our hands. We cleanse our hands. James writes in verse 8, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Hands refers to what a person does. It's our behavior. When, when someone is involved in something illegal, uh, we will sometimes say about them, they got their hands dirty. See, friendship with the world is behaving like the world. It's getting our hands dirty. And dirty hands hinder our fellowship with Christ. And so if we're going to draw close to Christ in fellowship, we must cleanse our hands, the Bible says. We must confess, we must repent of anything in our life that makes us a friend of the world or friends with the world. 1 John 1, 9 
says this, and this was written to believers. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to do what? Forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Listen, we have to cleanse our hands. If we want to draw all close to, to, to Christ in, in fellowship, got it. we got to cleanse our hands through confessing our sins. Secondly, we have to purify our hearts. James writes in verse 8, purify your hearts, you double-minded. The word heart, it refers to our inner life, our mind, our will, our emotions. Double-minded speaks of wavering between two opinions. It refers to someone who can't make up their mind. You know anybody like that? Some of you, quit glancing at your husband and wife now. Come on now. We all know people who can't make up their mind, right? They just waver between two opinions. That's what it means to be double-minded. It refers to someone who simply can't make up their mind. And the believers that James was writing to, they couldn't make up their mind. They couldn't make up their mind whether they wanted to be a friend of the world or a friend of God. And there's a lot of people today, they can't make up their mind whether they want to be a friend of God or a friend of the world. They're double-minded. They're wavering between two opinions. But if we want to draw close to Christ in fellowship, we have to purify our heart. That is, our thoughts must be toward Christ and not toward the world. 1 Peter 1.22 says, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, Pure hearts are those that are set apart under Christ through obedience. It is the pure in heart, the Bible teaches, that are able to, to draw close to Jesus Christ and see him in their life. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So we have to cleanse our hands, purify our hearts. Third, we have to be sorrowful. James writes in verse 9, Be wretched and mourn and weep. In other words, James is telling them they need to be sorrowful over their sin. They need to be sorrowful over their wickedness, their friendship with the world. Uh, that, world that, that, that phrase, be wretched, some of you have uh, a translation that says be afflicted. The word conveys the thought of something miserable, something painful. It is realizing the misery of one's sin. And we have to realize the misery of our own sin. Because until we do, we're never going to confess. We're never going to change the way we think. We're never going to draw, draw close to Christ. He says we must mourn. This is grief that cannot be concealed. In Ezra 9.3, the Bible tells us how Ezra responded when he heard that the Israelites had not separated themselves from the people of the world, but had actually married them. It says, as soon as I heard this, I tore my garment, my cloak, and I pulled hair from my head and beard and sat a fall. Now that's mourning that is clearly visible, right? When you begin to tear your garments, when you begin to pull your hair out of your head and your beard. But that was how they mourned back then. That's how they mourned over sin. It's, it was something that, it was grief over sin that could not be concealed. And Bhakti says, and we. It simply means to wail aloud. It was a word used of an animal in pain that was crying out loudly. All of these words speak to how we need to be sorrowful over our sin. There is no way, listen, there is no way that we will ever draw close to Christ in fellowship if we're not broken over our sin. And that's something that we have lost in our society. In our society. We need to return to bro a brokenness over our own sin. Psalm 51, 17 says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. And finally, and we're closing with this. Cleanse our hands. Purify our hearts. We be sorrowful. And finally, we need to be serious that we're going to draw close to Christ. James writes in verse 9, Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Laughter here, it, just, it, it, it speaks of, it's a mark of gratification. I mean, these people were, were laughing about their self-gratification. James says you should be mourning. Again, that word simply means grief. It means sorrow. He says turn your, your, your joy, your cheerfulness, your gladness should be turned to gloom. That word gloom, it, it, it spoke of a downcast look, a, a sadness. I mean, all of us have seen people, we, we could just tell by their countenance on their face that, that they were downcast. 
that they, there's something going on in their lives. James says, these, basically what James is saying, these people were laughing in gratification when they should have been mourning. Their countenance was one of joy when it should have been one of sadness. Ecclesiastes 3, 4 through 5 says there's a time to weep and there's a time to laugh. There's a time to mourn and there's a time to dance. If we're going to draw close to Jesus Christ in fellowship, we must be serious about our sin. We must know when it's time to laugh and when it's time to mourn. We must know when it's time to be upbeat in joy and when it's time to be down flat, downcast in gloom. There's a time for celebration, church. And there's a time for contrition. And we must be discerning of the time. And the readers that James was writing to, the people, that, the believers that James was writing to, they were not discerning. They were celebrating when they should have had a contrite heart. James, James closes with these words in verse 10. He says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Humility before the Lord results in spiritual victory. We need to know that it's never God's desire to put us down. If you're here today, understand it is never, ever, ever the heart of God to put you down. God is out to lift us up. That's what he wants to do in all of our lives. It is sin, it is pride that bring us down in spiritual defeat. And so if we want to walk in spiritual victory, then we must walk in humility before the Lord. I said it earlier, but let me say it again for emphasis. The way up to victory is down, the way down to defeat is up. Humility brings victory. Pride brings defeat. So how do we walk in spiritual victory? Well, in humility, in humility, we devote ourselves to Christ, we submit ourselves to Christ, we draw near to Christ. My prayer for every single person in this room is that you will be a person who walks in spiritual victory. That the norm of your life, the norm of your life will, will not be defeat. That the norm of your life will be victory. That the norm of your life will be that you're passionate about Jesus Christ. That you're excited about what he's doing in your life every single day. And let it be said of you, boy, that person, they're having one. And in your heart, you're going to know, nope, that's normal Christian living. That's a person walking in spiritual victory. That's the kind of person that I want to be. Every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. Today, do you know Jesus? Does he know you? Say, so what do you mean? Has there ever been a time where you've entered into an intimate, personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ? Has there ever been a time in your life where you've admitted that you've sinned against God? That you've believed in your heart that Jesus Christ came to die in your place on the cross. That he shed his blood for the redemption of your sin. So that you could be redeemed by his blood. Has there ever been a time where you've confessed Jesus Christ to be your Savior and to be your Lord? If not, you need to take a step today. You need to take a step to salvation. Right where you're at, I want to invite you to do something. Would you just say this prayer? If it's the attitude of your heart today that you would confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, trust in Him alone for your salvation. Would you say this? I believe, Jesus, that you came to this earth to be my Savior. I confess that you died for my sin according to Scripture, that you were buried, and on the third day you were raised to life according to the Scripture. Today I place my faith and trust in you alone for my salvation and surrender to you as my Lord. Thank you. For shedding your blood so that I could be forgiven of my sin. I give you my life so that you can give me your life. I love you, Jesus. Every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. I wonder if there's anybody here who for the very first time you prayed that prayer. You
you trusted Jesus for your salvation. I'm going to ask you to do something. There's nobody looking around. It's just me, you, and the Lord. Would you just slip up your hand right where you're at? Anybody? I want to invite you to look this way. I believe that God always calls us to take the next step. I don't know what that next step is for you, but I know the invitation is, is for you to take a next step today. Maybe the next step that you need to take today is, is simply the step of identification. You've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, but you have never been baptized. Listen, baptism is simply just a, it's a, it's a public expression. It's, it's one way that we identify with Jesus Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. It's saying to the world, I've been buried with Christ in death, but he's raised me to a new life. And if you've never done that, I would encourage you to take that step. Maybe it's a step of association. Maybe you need to, to come and you need to, uh, you need to join this church fellowship. You need to be, become a co-worker with us in the advancement of the gospel of the kingdom of God. I would encourage you to take that step. Or maybe it's simply a step of dedication. Uh, you just need to come down to the altars today. Uh, you, need to, you need to say, the answer is yes. The answer is yes. What is it you have me to do, Lord? I'm willing to serve you wherever, whenever, however. Maybe you just need to come and take that step today. Father, thank you again for the opportunity to hear your word. And Father, you desire more from us than just to be hearers of the word. You desire that we would be doers of the word. So there's a battle going on right now in our hearts. We know what we've heard. We know what your spirit is calling us to do, but the battle is waging. I pray by your grace, we would not walk out of this place defeated, but that we would walk out of this place in victory because we have done what you called us to do right now. So thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are moving up and down the aisles even now. And you're, you're, you're speaking to hearts. You're making known what you desire. And so may you be lifted up, Jesus. May you be glorified. May hearts at this moment be drawn to you and you alone, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. As we stand to sing. If you take the step that God is calling you to take right now, don't wait. Right now. Just
today, do you know that if you walk out of this place, that you've done everything that you know you're to do before you leave this place today? I'm not one, listen, I'm not trying to pressure you to come down here, but I just know this much. I know God's at work. And I know you'll never be at peace until you do what God wants you. You do what God wants you to do. You can run. You can run, but you can't hide. God knows where you're at. You don't have to be right here. He's gonna, he knows where you're at. And he's going to continue to bring conviction to your soul and to your heart until you make the decision that you need to make. Better to surrender now and enjoy the peace of God than to keep running and be under conviction. That's no way to live your life. God loves you. He wants what's best for you. I'm not going to extend this out any longer. We're going to sing another verse. If you're fighting, surrender. Give in. You'll be glad that you did. As we sing, you come as the Lord leads you. Just